We're talking about efficient deep flaps today. I hope that piqued your curiosity. I'll explain. The letters DEEP, D-I-E-P, stand for Deep Inferior Epigastric Perforators, referring to the type of breast reconstruction that uses a patient's tummy tissue and underlying blood vessels to reconstruct a soft, warm breast after mastectomy due to breast cancer. I enjoy sharing information via my podcast, but I often listen to other podcasts too while I'm churning away on the elliptical at the gym. A recent podcast I was listening to is the Resident Review Podcast. The hosts are plastic surgery residents sharing valuable information for other residents in plastic surgery, but their guests span a wide range of contributors. It is geared for listeners ranging from students in training to board certified plastic surgeons and others, others that would be me. When I find an open source, to learn about breast reconstruction, I utilize it. A particular episode on the resident review was honestly the idea for me to do this Deep Sea Journey podcast today. When I went through my own deep flat breast reconstruction, I did a lot of research. I found it interesting, fascinating, and more importantly, helped me with my own decision-making process for breast reconstruction. But not everyone's like that. Some look to others for guidance, and these days patients are speaking to other patients. This is our goal today, to provide information for patients for the process of deep flap with my guest, an expert in the field of deep flap breast reconstruction. Another open source in plastic surgery I utilize frequently is PRS Go. That stands for Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Global Open. The Resident Review podcast took one of those papers and discussed it in an interview with my guest today. Let me introduce him. Dr. Nicholas Haddock is board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. He is a Texas native who earned his undergraduate and medical degree at the University of Texas. Dr. Haddock went on to further his training at the prestigious New York University Plastic Surgery Training Program, followed by a year refining his technique at the University of Pennsylvania before returning to Texas. Now he practices in Dallas, Texas, offering his patients the latest options in breast reconstruction surgery. We'll put his contact and practice information in the show notes. So good morning from Seattle, Dr. Haddock. Have you had your coffee? Uh, Well, I have. Thank you. Uh, Pleasure to be here. It's good to have you too. I really appreciate it. I was really fascinated with the paper that you and your colleague, partner, Dr. Samit Tiosha authored in the PRS Global Open. It was entitled Efficient Deep Flap, Bilateral Breast Reconstruction in Less Than Four Hours. So I want to talk to you about this today to help patients understand what working with a team means, who that team includes, and giving patients some grasp of what time is involved in a deep flap. Although it seems like a really long, daunting surgery to many, When you read or hear about all the moving parts, excuse the tongue in cheek, it can be very efficient too. But I feel like what patients don't know is what we can tackle today. And in fact, it's the unknown that really prevents some patients from choosing this type of reconstruction, which are time concerns, right? Yeah, for sure. I think when when patients are thinking about this operation, you can you can kind of present deep flaps in a lot of different ways. And, and, you know, depending on, unfortunately, depending on the bias of the surgeon, you can make it sound like a horrible operation, or you can make it sound like a a great option for breast Mm -hmm. reconstruction. And so this paper was focused really on one facet of deep flaps and kind of our, our journey. And you mentioned my partner, Samit Tiosha, we work together hand in hand for really all of our, our flat based deep flaps or alternative flaps breast reconstructions, our journey over the last decade has been trying to optimize these operations and offer more options for patients. And so efficiency is one facet of that. There are a lot of other facets that we've actually published on, but efficiency has become one of our more recent kind of focuses in the sense of exactly what you said. It can seem very daunting. The national average or averages for these operations are you know, nine hours or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of people, when they hear that that number, it's like, oh, I don't, I don't want that operation. I don't, I don't want a nine hour operation. I, it makes me more scared than anything. And right. I don't want to be in the hospital for five 
days and, and things like that. And so if you can make this into a four hour operation routinely, then most people can swallow that a little bit better. Yeah. And so that's that's a totally different in the sense of the salesmanship to a patient. So oh, four hours isn't so bad. And then the other follow up to this concept of efficiency, and we we actually have some follow up studies looking at this, is that what we've shown in the sense of this project and another project is that the the more efficient you get, at least in our practice, the more focused we get, and the lower complication rates we have. And I think that's critical because sometimes in medicine, the complaint or the criticism, I should say, of the word efficiency is, well, we don't need to be efficient. We're taking care of humans. We need to be safe, right? Right. So do those do those two things compete? And I would argue they, they don't when done correctly. Yeah. And so we do have a, we have another paper. It will not be in PRS Go, it will be in, in the other PRS, so it won't be in the open access but it kind of looks at that and, and we have this sustained decrease in operative times. And at the same time, we have a decrease in, in all our complication rates, mm-hmm. which I think is interesting, especially for patients. So this this concept of efficiency is not just about efficiency. It's about doing things better. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's a couple of things you said, Dr. Haddock. One is that you work with, you know, your team member, but a team doesn't always include another surgeon. I always say it's a well-oiled machine in the OR from start to finish. A hundred percent. Our team is all inclusive and we can't do this without every member of it. And that starts off in the office with my nurse and admin in the office and then MP and then goes to the OR where we have our anesthesia colleagues. We've got our scrub techs. We've got our nurses in the OR. We have a system. And, you know, the the nice thing that that I have is we do a lot of these. And so when I go to work, I, I see the same faces, right? It's it's kind of that same team. And there's a couple of people that come in and out, whatnot, but more or less the people we work with do this with us every day. And because of that, we have, as you said, a well oiled machine. Mm-hmm. There's there's no question of, do we have the instruments ready? Do we have the microscope ready? Do we, it it just flows. And and that makes it a very pleasant place to work and it it helps our patients. And then and then that keeps going into post op care. It's our nurses on the floor are fantastic. Some people have started a lot of centers have started doing this, but we no longer go to the ICU for monitoring and our floor mm-hmm. nurses are great and it makes the patient experience better because it's not Honestly, our ICU rooms, at, uh, I'm at UT Southwestern, our, our ICU beds look, the rooms look the exact same as a regular room. So people wouldn't know the difference. But the term ICU, again, is one of these things that, oh, I don't want to go to ICU. That sounds scary. Well, it never was scary because patients didn't really need to go to the ICU from a medical. It was really just monitoring. So it was really about mm-hmm. nursing ratios. But we have floor nurses that do that now. And so it's it's the whole process of start to finish for the patients. And that is the team. It's it is everyone. And so that that includes the two quarterbacks that you mentioned, myself and and Dr. Teosha, but you got everybody else that that has to be there to to make it work. Yeah. And you have to have buy-in from that team too. I'm not making any comparisons here, Dr. Haddock, trust me. But when I was in the classroom, you know, some of the things that you are saying I would engage other students. I would engage my support staff to help me maximize learning for students. And basically, that's what you're doing. You know, you have come up with an efficient way of maximizing your team for the benefit of the patient. But I have to say something, too, in defense of everyone in the OR, it's better for you guys, too. You know, less time in the OR, right? Yeah, so no question. It's kind of a, you know, we often talk about like the downward spiral for negative things. This is like the upward spiral reverse. Mm -hmm. And you can manage that a couple different ways. One is, yes, less, honestly, less stress. My easier days are my flap days, oddly. The days that I'm doing revisions and other stuff are my longer days. And that even even yesterday we did we actually did a bilateral lumbar flap, which is kind of a, a more unique flap that we do. And then we also did a deep flap following it. So we did two bilateral flaps in the same day and home home by five, five thirty, which is not a bad day for a surgeon. No. So in that situation we accomplished we took care of two two patients. One was a little bit more complex with the lumbar 